Welcome everybody to the Horasis Extraordinary Meeting. It's great to have you join us from all over the world. I would like to introduce our panel session right now, which is called Revitalizing Economic Growth. Of course, this is the topic we have to talk about in these uh, coronavirus pandemic times. This is something that affects all of us. My name is Martina Fox. I'm an international TV anchor and a business journalist based in London and Zurich, currently talking to you from Switzerland. Without further ado, I would like to introduce now our distinguished panelists. We are still waiting for some people to join our virtual room, our online stage, so please bear with us. But we have two excellent, excellent speakers here with us already. First of all, I would like to introduce Ms. Suchata Koirala. She's the former Deputy Prime Minister of Nepal. Thank you so much for joining us today, Suchata. Good morning. And we have live from Tokyo joining us today, Mr. Oki Matsumoto. He's the chairman of Monex Group in Japan. Thank you also, Oki, for joining us. It's great to have you from Asia already. It's a bit later in the day. It's still pretty early here in Switzerland. COVID-19, of course, has changed uh, our world forever. Nothing is as it was before a couple of months ago with so many economic and political uncertainties. The International Monetary Fund, for example, the IMF, is now predicting a deeper recession than previously forecast. They expect global output to shrink by some 4.9% this year before a recovery to 5.4% in 2021. So what kind of challenges are we going to face? I would like to start our discussion right now with a 60-second challenge to both of you at the moment, how to revitalize economic growth, our topic. I would like to give the floor, first of all, to Sujata. How can we do this? How can we achieve this? Okay, Martina, thank you very much. I am happy to join this virtual meeting. It is such a pleasure to see distinguished uh, speakers today. Uh, the outbreak of coronavirus has been devastating in terms of cost of human lives across the globe. The COVID-19 pandemic has also caused economic catastrophe worldwide. Global economy is shrinking and pushing us backward. The primary indicators are so depressing about the global economy falling into an unprecedented recession. A report of IMF, as you mentioned, says it could be a major economic recession after the great economic depression of the 1930s and will be worse in the financial crisis of 2008 and 9. No one, not even it exists, seem to be sure when the normality will return. There are forecasts that 2021 would also see a partial recovery. Given the centrality of the human capital, the recovery period depends on how quick and effective healthcare facilities we can provide and manage. It is my feeling that only a secure and super healthcare facilities in place and backed by adequate resources will help for the resumption of economic activity to create what we call a new normal. Um, to prevent long-term negative consequences of health and economic emergencies, the governments and communities require more unity, more cooperation, solidarity, and a collective and cooperative global response. So more importantly, early innovation of vaccines is largely, largely required to prevent, contain, and mitigate the viruses so that um, global stability and economic revival arrive sooner than later. There is a danger of COVID-19 pandemic pushing larger number of people into poverty trap. It has caused jobless, soaring, lowering income, 
higher health expenses, higher household expenses, expenses, low productivity, mental stress, low consumption, domestic violence, and social distress and imbalance. Gender violence seems to be another pandemic in the making. In Nepal, this is very much rising. Moreover, the collapse of commodity prices, capital flow, reversal, unemployment, fixed requiring expenses will lead to the closure of factories, labor, unrest, and heavy financial losses. So I will tell you now about Nepal. Can I? Or, uh, we will move on uh, to Oki right now. I need also to say that um, we have a few speakers who are not able to join us. Um, so, Ms. Fausa Kofi, she's the Vice President of the National Assembly in Afghanistan. She uh, just sent me a WhatsApp message that she's in important talks with uh, the Taliban in Doha right now. So, unfortunately, she is not able to join us. Um, we're also still waiting for um, His Excellency Francisco Daquila, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of the Philippines. Um, I think there are some technical issues and also we're still waiting for uh, Mr. Eric Bergloff, the new Chief Economist of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, who is trying to join as well. So while we're waiting, um, I would like to move on to Oki now with your 60 second uh, recipe, how to revitalize global economic growth. Well, uh, thank you, Martina. Well, you know, it's, it's not easy to come up with 60 seconds recipe <laughs> to revitalize the world it's economy. Six, right? the, my business is, uh, you know, uh, an online space. Right. And uh, we are actually, you know, my company is being an uh, online brokerage uh, in Japan, in the States and Hong Kong and China. And we are actually having, uh, you know, good, uh, how do you say, uh, good, uh, good volume, you know, since uh, this uh, COVID situation started. I sit on the board of MasterCard as well, uh, in, in the States and listening to them again, you know, there are many areas of, uh, you know, uh, certain uh, businesses, they are actually growing uh, much more than, you know, it used to be, okay? So it's not just the entire world is dipping. It's like, uh, you know, there's a, some some part of the business is not doing good, but some part is doing doing good. And I think, um, I think it is essentially important uh, to, correctly change the regulations. You know, the, with COVID, everything really changed. But I have to say that many regulations, the legal framework, many things are still, you know, for COVID, right? So for the, the business sector or entrepreneurs, then to work with the, the governments and the correctly and the, uh, quick, quickly uh, change the regulations to fit to the, the current post-COVID uh, uh, world. I think that would be very important to revitalize the, the world uh, economy. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Oki. We have now uh, His Excellency Francisco Daquila joining us, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of the Philippines. Can you hear me loud and clear? Good morning. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. We As I understand the question is on the revitalizing economic growth. Yes, exactly. In a short uh, couple of sentences, what is your idea? What is your success recipe to revitalize economic growth? I think um, His Excellency has just dropped out again. <laughs> I hope we can come back very soon. Otherwise, we will just uh, carry on the uh, conversation. Oh, no, you're back. You're back, okay. your Excellency. So, okay. How to revitalize uh, economic growth, uh, Your Excellency? Uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you can speak. Okay. 
How shall yes. we revitalize economic growth? Okay, okay. Uh, now, let me uh, approach it from the Philippines' uh, point of view. Please. Uh, now, uh, uh, most essential that we've found is the ability to craft and implement measures that squarely address this uh, pandemic and its impact. So in our case, um, the central bank, the Banco Central of Filipinas government implemented very early on a wide range of measures within the ambit of monetary policy and banking supervision. And this included the insurance of sufficient liquidity in the market in order to support also government programs uh, to save um, the uh, livelihoods uh, because of the, that we were affected by the lockdown and to maintain stability of the financial system and to ensure continued delivery of financial services to the public as well as to shore up confidence and cushion economic activity. So what we found is that very early on uh, in March, as the uh, impact of the pandemic became very uncertain, uh, financial markets um, tended to dry up. And given these measures, we have um, uh, restored normality to uh, domestic uh, financial markets. So uh, this one also uh, illustrates uh, the need for a whole of government approach and systems thinking in order to find solutions. And then um, in our case, we also have a very active private sector that is carrying out various initiatives to alleviate the plight of uh, affected uh, Filipinos. So we coordinated with the national government, um, provided the national government uh, provisional advances in the amount of 300 billion pesos. And the funds were used by the government in providing support to uh, families and livelihoods. Um, this is well within the uh, provisions of the Charter of the BSP and subject to limits imposed by the Charter. And in so doing, we uh, preserve the independence of the BSP. Uh, this is a very short term uh, facility and uh, uh, the uh, the uh, constraints uh, preclude us from uh, 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 financing the deficit on the longer term. Um, and uh, we also cooperated with other central banks to pursue um, initiatives that are contributing to economic growth and financial stability. The uh, third uh, that we have uh, uh, found essential is the recognition um, and the seizing of opportunities behind the challenges. That is uh, taking the crisis as a lesson for forward planning. And the pandemic and restrictions have accelerated the digital transformation of financial services. So we've taken this opportunity to further support and implement digitalization initiatives, uh, particularly on the payment systems. So thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much for your overview. I would like to continue our conversation with uh, Ms. Koirala. So uh, Sujata, of course, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic has been really huge on Nepal. Nepal is a wonderful country. I've been there several times. Lots of mountains, a lot of tourists usually. What has been the impact and how soon do you think can we restart the domestic economic recovery? Uh, like other uh, developing and developed countries, Nepal is also struggling to overcome this crisis. Nepal, a uh, landlocked and least developed country, has its own features. Economy projected to suffer greatly with the decline of remittance inflow, tourism industry, and international trade. It is no exaggeration to say that remittance is the main stay of the Nepali economy which represents more than one fourth of national GDP. Nepali migrant workers send more than $8.64 billion 
in 2018, making the country one of the biggest beneficiaries of remittance in the world. But this year, it is expected to drop by uh, 14% or even more because of economic distress stemming from the pandemic. Similarly, an another pillar of Nepali economy is tourism industry, which is suffering immensely. The reduced flow of tourist restrictions on the entry of citizens from infected countries and the cancellation of Visit Nepal 2020 have put the industry in peril. It is very proud that Nepal has a huge amount of natural resources such as mines and minerals, uh, different metallic and non-metallic ores, hydrocarbons, hydroelectricity, herbal and medical uh, medicinal plants. Now we should focus on prospect and extract them from which we can generate generate large number of employment and revenue because most of the people are going to come back. All the youth, you know, they will lose their job and they are going to come back to Nepal. And we have also agriculture. A lot of people depend on that also. Farming and uh, so we can focus on that. Like uh, Nepal, uh, you know, Rashtra Bank, uh, which is our central bank of Nepal, announced its monetary policy for the fiscal year 2020-21 that unveiled rescue packages to mitigate the economic effects of COVID-19. It promised to support the expansion of loan repayment, deadline, refinance facility, grace period extension of infrastructure projects, and targeted lending in productive sectors as cheaper rate as key measures for relief and revival of various sectors affected by the virus. So micro, micro, small and medium enterprises contribute a major in remote economics, regardless of developing and developed countries around the globe. Such enterprises comprise of 90% of businesses and more than 70% of employment worldwide. It also contributes up to 40% of national income GDP in global economy. Since small and medium enterprises are the backbone of Nepali economy, it is therefore necessary to address their concerns. So as we believe that every cloud has silver lining, COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to see some opportunities amidst mountains of challenges to the Nepali economy too. Therefore, we should build up an entrepreneurship-based economy for the sustainable growth. Number of youths are expected to return back home land, losing their jobs in abroad, and this should be a good time to deploy them into production and other entrepreneur-related uh, activities, uh, revive village economy. And uh, you know, in Nepal, we always uh, look at the big cities, but now people are thinking that they uh, should go back to the village and develop. Uh, the cities and agriculture and farming and so there are positive side also and we depend on foreign investment. Nepali Nepali economy was very dependent on foreign economy and now people are realizing that we have to stand on our own feet. So these are the positive sides, you know, to be more independent. There is always a light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you so much. I just heard that uh, on the other side, the new incoming of the AIRB has technical issues, so we'll just carry on the conversation for others. Um, okay, Mr. Matsumoto, I would like to uh, talk about the policy levels. I would like to talk about the private sector as well in the COVID-19 pandemic. You are uh, the chairman of Monex Group, one of the biggest financial companies in Japan and a huge online securities trading company as well. From your perspective, what kind of policy changes do you want to see to really revitalize uh, the private sector? Well, 
Can, can you repeat the last part of the question again? What kind of policy measures would you like to see to restart, kickstart the Japanese economy? The Japanese economy, I have to say, uh, compared to probably most of the uh, uh, developed countries, the, the dip of economy uh, because of the COVID uh, be probably uh, somehow limited. Um, because because the uh, somehow you know that uh, the pandemic is not really uh, strong in Japan. Why is you that? Know, I don't know. There are the many hypotheses around that. But so far, there have been only 1,500 deaths in Japan total total to date this year. Uh, because of the uh, the COVID, uh, which is, you know, among the all death in Japan, you know, uh, due to anything, like cancer or heart attack or accident or whatever, you know, among the all death, the COVID, uh, uh, the, the death because of COVID represents only 0.2%, only 0.2% of the entire death. It's really nothing in Japan. So um, still, people uh, are worried about, you know, uh, you know. As a, so everything is actually uh, uh, very close to normal. You know, I, I go to the office every day, and uh, restaurants are open, and uh, transportation is uh, moving, and uh, so it, things are very, very normal. Except we don't see any tourists from abroad. <laughs> Right? If it's a Chinese or you know Europeans, Americans, we don't see any tourists. Uh, but basically, you know, the, the domestic economy is somehow funny. Um, the um, I think uh, you know, and, and also the, the government is really now shifting the policy um, to try to revitalize the economy. They're doing. Uh, uh, you know the government sponsored campaign to to subsidize the, uh, the uh, travelers inside the country. So Japanese go to other parts of the uh, Japan. You know, the government is subsidizing uh, those uh, activities. Government is going to subsidize the you know uh, eating at the restaurants as well. So so we are doing uh, lots of lots of talk, uh, those kind of things, and that should. Uh, revitalize, uh, restart. It's not really restart, but that will help the uh, economic activities to grow. I think the, the biggest program uh, Japan will be facing is the what we're going to do on this money spent. <laughs> so we are heavily, we have a heavily, how do you say, uh, indebted and uh, we are spending more money than before. So the, the, you know, the, 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 the public uh, debt compared to GDP is one of the highest in the world. So that is going to be the, the, the big issue. We will have a lot of challenges because one of the biggest news out of Japan, of course, this year has been the resignation of Shinzo Abe, right? So this will be a Topic and challenge uh, for the new government. Um, how well do you see them tackle this issue, and what kind of suggestions uh, do you have? And you know, this is Japan. Uh, changing prime minister is not like a changing uh, the president of the United States. Okay. <laughs> so, so changing. Uh, yeah, the Prime Minister of Japan changing doesn't really matter a lot. And actually, new Prime Minister Suga, he's doing great. I mean, it's been only like a two weeks or three weeks so far, but he's been great, doing great. And I, we don't see any, how do you say, negative uh, headwind because of the uh, Shinzo Abe step down. Okay. Let's hope for the best. I would like to move on back to the Philippines to His Excellency Mr. Uh, Dakila. I, I hope you're fine wearing the mask there. Um, we have. Okay. 
economic news, of course, coming out of the Philippines. We know that because of the pandemic, uh, the economy has plunged um, to the lowest level in 29 years, the biggest recession in 29 years. Yeah. Um, second yeah. quarter GDP is down 5.5 percent. So it's really so minus 16.5. Yes. So, 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 tell us um, uh, how you know tough is the situation, and how do you see a potential recovery? What are the ingredients needed to kickstart the economy once again? Okay. Uh, actually, what I'd like to emphasize is that uh, uh, we came into uh, this uh, situation in a position of strength. Um, the contraction in GDP really uh, emanates from the um, restrictions that we imposed in order to contain the spread of the virus. But uh, uh, so given that uh, we have gone into a recession and uh, our uh, projection is that the economy can shrink by between four and a half to six and a half percent this year. But uh, once we have uh, uh, relaxed these uh, restrictions, we are expecting a strong bounce back and the growth of uh, six and a half to seven and a half percent for 2021. And in particular, uh, growth sectors uh, can include IT, telecom, and infrastructure. Infrastructure because of the uh, government's um, infrastructure program. And of course, as we shift to a uh, new economic arrangements, that will prove as a boost to telecom. But um, uh, when we look at the other parameters on inflation, we are well within target uh, for this year and over the next two years, the policy horizon. And uh, uh, actually the balance of risks are a little bit tilted to downside with respect to inflation because of, again, the potential impact on global and domestic growth from uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, on the, uh, the peso, uh, we're one of the most appreciated in the region. And, uh, um, and that can be attributed to uh, what has happened to the uh, balance of the payments. It was a very strong performance for the first um, half of the year, actually um, $4.1 billion surplus from January to June. Mm -hmm. And what we're expecting is that uh, the balance of payments will be in surplus for the entire year. Now, the current account, which we had uh, initially projected would be in a deficit position, again, uh, had a, a strong surplus uh, position uh, for the first half of the year at um, $4.4 billion. Mm. And it, uh, again, looks like that for the entire year, uh, the current account will be in surplus. The what are the main factors uh, driving the current account into a surplus that uh, you think? Yeah. Really, really uh, one is uh, we have seen both imports and imports, uh, exports and imports co contract, but uh, imports have uh, contracted um, contracted uh, faster than exports. Again. Uh, this is across the board. So capital goods, consumer goods imports have uh, gone down, but um, uh, the oil has also helped to bring down our uh, import cost. Um, again, uh, 
we are seeing a, a bit of a recovery in oil prices, but um, even even the, with that, uh, oh, imports will still be uh, still will will be down. So the offshoot of this is, as I said, the currency is quite strong, and our uh, international reserves are at a record high, at more than ninety eight billion dollars. Remittances we had uh, projected would contract by five percent. But um, year to date, uh, we're seeing that the contraction will only be about half of that. And uh, for two months, we've actually seen a recovery in, uh, in remittances. So it looks like uh, um, the impact on remittances may not be as worse as we, as we had expected. And that is also going to help in, um, in the, uh, the current account position. Let's hope that we see a pickup uh, in the recovery very soon. I would like to bring in China as well. Unfortunately, we do not have the AIIB chief economist uh, here with us because of logistical issues and technical issues. But um, of course, we have to talk about China because the three of you are joining me from Asia. It's the Asian century and China is the second largest economy in the world, doing a lot of trade, a lot of business with all of your countries. So Ms. Kerala, China with the Belt and Road Initiative is heavily invested in Nepal as well. There are very important uh, bilateral relations as well. To which extent do you think can China maybe help in the recovery when it comes to trade and so on um, with uh, Nepal? How important is this going to be? Uh, China is our uh, neighbor. One side we have China, another side India. And uh, China is our friendly country and has been supporting Nepal in hard time. And uh, we, of course, China being one of the largest economy and just being our neighbor and so big country with so many population and uh, developed country, we expect that China will support Nepal in future to recover our economy. And uh, we also get a lot of support uh, from Japan. Uh, Japanese are a very friendly country to Nepal. And we have been getting since long, for nearly about uh, 40 years or so, Japan's, uh, Japanese, Japanese help and support. And uh, now the China is also one of the largest economy, and of course Nepal, uh, Nepal has uh, many possibilities. I'm very optimistic that Nepal, from all these Asian countries, you know, we will get uh, support and we will uh, manage our economy. Okay, Ms. Matsumoto, I just mentioned Japan, and you are obviously headquartered in Tokyo, but also have business in China, the U.S., and you have to mention the U.S.-China trade war and elections in the U.S. Uh, we just had Trump-Biden, um, you know, the very heated debate, of course. And what kind of issues does this pose to you? Um, you imagine, you know, to move to other countries as well, like Nepal, with Monex Group, uh, to avoid, you know, geopolitical issues, or what's your future plan when it comes to uh, the business of Monex Group? Well, okay. Yeah, the, uh, the China issue is really uh, annoying. I mean, U.S.-China tension is a big issue, and for Japan, because uh, of course you know Japan is just next to China, and China is a very, very, very important uh, kind of partner. But meanwhile, Japan is a uh, you know true ally of uh, the United States, and uh, the U.S. current you know U uh, U.S. administration is putting uh, lots of uh, kind of sanctions or limitations to um, uh, U.S. corporations 
to trade with Chinese uh, corporations. And that actually, you know, it's not just for the U.S. corporations. You know, some regulations actually you know, apply to Japanese corporations as well. So, um, for example, just like uh, this, this Monday, you know, the Kyokushia, which is the, um, you know, the, the, the uh, how do you say, a one, a part of Toshiba, uh, which is uh, creating a flash memory or those kind of things. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the, uh, Huawei is uh, the big buyer of that uh, flash memory from Kyokushia. But because of the, uh, the U.S. regulations, sanctions, you know, after September 15, Kyokushia cannot export uh, those uh, uh, flash memories and others to Huawei. And because of that, they stopped IPO. They were uh, preparing the, uh, to do IPO, but uh, uh, and then, you know, uh, they finished the book building last week, but uh, this Monday, they canceled the initial public offering. So that kind of thing, uh, you know, already happening. And, uh, and also politicians, you know, um, politicians, again, you know, between politicians and uh, the private sector, usually there's a lots of uh, kind of uh, two-way discussions. But once it comes down to the national security issue, politicians become very strong and the private sector cannot really uh, negotiate with politicians. So I think uh, the current U.S.-China tension is really kind of, uh, how do you say, over caving some uh, negative pressure to Japanese economical activity. It could, it could actually last much longer than the COVID. Because COVID, as I said, you know, in Japan, it's not as very large. And it will, it's, it won't go away. But, it, but if it's SARS or HIV or whatever, once it was very big, but uh, it kind of, uh, you know, calms down in, in the society, right? It takes maybe two years, but just two years. But this uh, U.S.-China tension can last, like, uh, decades. For a lot uh, of time, no matter the result of the U.S. presidential elections, we just have no future clue, right? There's so much uncertainty in the world. Um, Doctor, right. yes, absolutely. Um, Your Excellency, Mr. Uh, Dakila, um, of course, um, the uh, you know, Central Bank of the Philippines is also actively involved in discussions with other central banks in the world. Um, what about the PBOC? Can you update us on monetary policy discussions with the PBOC when it comes to currency swap agreements or any other, you know, discussions you have with China? What kind of color collaborations and cooperations you would like to see with China? Yeah. And well, the, um, the discussions, the policy discussions are through the uh, uh, with other central banks in the region, and in particular on how to uh, enhance the safety nets available to um, the other central banks. So um, that is a, um, that is the thrust of the, um, the, the discussions now. And the other areas of uh, concern would be how to move forward the interoperability of payment systems. As we know, when uh, as we shift to new economic arrangements, um, the, uh, here in the Philippines, what we have seen is an acceleration in the uh, use of the digital means of payments. Uh, so this does not really pertain to uh, China in a particular, but to the means of, uh, uh, of uh, doing a trade as a whole. Um, now on the uh, the China, of course, China is something that we uh, were watching. Um, actually, prior to the pandemic, we listed uh, the um, uh, the trade tension between the U.S. and China as one of the um, main, the main downside risks to 
uh, to trade. And um, it is good that uh, we now can see um, China uh, uh, recovering um, and uh, there is um, uh, with that a chance that uh, um, China can again serve as an engine of uh, uh, growth in trade for the region. No, uh, Asia is heavily dependent on global supply chains and uh, we cannot really grow if uh, there is a, a, a growing a, a tension in the area of uh, trade. Um, but having said that, um, we're also in the Philippines um, um, not really that dependent on trade as an engine of growth. And um, there is a focus on the domestic economy in our case. Um, so that is also uh, one reason why the, uh, the um, uh, contraction in the second quarter is really... Um, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, 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 say um, largest spike in the uh, contraction. Um, so uh, again, uh, I think that's what I have to. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that we are looking at and play uh, the role of economic uh, growth engine again, just like it did after the global financial crisis. Uh, Ms. Ferrala, um, I heard um, Dr. Dakia briefly talking about supply chains, disruptions, and so on. Um, in Nepal, which is a mountainous country, very much uh, you know based on tourism income and so on, I guess the disruptions have been really hard as well when it comes to digitization and new technologies and so on what kind of areas um, do you identify as potential growth drivers in nepal is it also you know things like blockchain crypto like what is the latest um, state of the art in nepal where do you see opportunities so like uh, you know like uh, chai chai with china nepal has uh, yeah, Nepal has uh, uh, like uh, signed the project PRI project, and under the framework of PRI, Nepal is already. it has signed the project, so Nepal can take a lot of advantages of from the PRI. You know, there this project since we have already signed, and uh, we can uh, we are uh, lacking uh, technology in Nepal. You know, last time we suffered a lot with the uh, earthquake and uh, our schools and uh, framework of the schools uh, we, we was all damaged. And now we seen again another catastrophe in Nepal. So we have to also think about uh, the, uh, through the BLM we can recover the economy, economy. And we have also become a member of infrastructure bank in China. So we can also take advantage of that uh, and, uh, and also from World Bank and Asian Development Bank, etc. We can uh, take a lot of financial uh, loan and support. And uh, technology this time uh, with the pandemic, you know, our students are suffering, the children are suffering the most because all the schools are closed. We don't have this online system. We don't have Wi-Fi everywhere the access is not there uh, and um, no, also the computer we don't have wi-fi system is not there in the mountain areas or uh, in the remote areas so um, children are suffering their education nepal is one country i think where there is actually for nine months now ten months children have no school they can with their exams they can go to school so we have to uh, see that we have to go for the digital system, online system, and we have to uh, develop uh, the technology uh, in Nepal, and which we can get support from different uh, development. Thank you so much. We just have one minute left. I would like to give the last word to Oki. Oki in online securities brokerage, what kind of new um, you know, technologies are you developing? Just in one minute, please. 
Well, you know, the, the lifestyle is completely changed. And uh, we just need to adapt to those changes. And so every day, I mean, innovation, you know, we need, just need, uh, you know, lots of lots of innovation. You know, as I said at the, at the beginning, changing regulation proactively from us to be talking to the, the government. That is something that we are focusing on. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Koirala. Mr. Matsumoto, Dr. Dakila, Your Excellency, thank you for joining us today. And thanks to our virtual audience from all around the world. Apologies that not every participant could make it uh, due to the technical problems uh, we face. But uh, let's make sure we connect on LinkedIn, on other social media platforms, and stay in touch. I wish you all the best. Stay healthy, stay safe, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.